Hello everyone, welcome to my humble abode. Uh, not, not our fun little classroom in Shannon, but we'll make do. So I wanted to lead a discussion on the idea of the bully pulpit. Um, it's a turn of phrase that was coined by Teddy Roosevelt uh, when he was president. And the definition of the bully pulpit is, quote, a prominent public position, such as a political office, that provides an opportunity for expounding one's views. And so it's sort of a place where you are standing in front of everyone, you're saying, listen to me, I have the power to tell you what to do. Um, and I think that's a really interesting idea, especially in modern terms. And I think that's sort of represented by the actual term bully pulpit, because when it was coined by Teddy Roosevelt, uh, the word bully didn't mean necessarily what it means today. It meant more, it, it's in the same vein as awesome and how that used to mean awe inspiring, like with a lot of power. Uh, a bully, pull, a bully as an adjective was something that described something that was superior or magnificent or powerful. And now, obviously, bully means someone who bullies someone else, who enforces their will. And I think that the idea of the bully pulpit has evolved with the terminology of it, actually, and how what originally sort of meant being able to project your ideas um, in a benevolent way that other people would hear can now sometimes be interpreted as preaching, as dictating to people what they should do. Uh, but that's interesting, but I didn't really want to look at that sort of negative aspect. I wanted to look at it in a more positive light, uh, but you can certainly see examples in the text we've looked at throughout the course um, of people who have, or almost as importantly, haven't had the benefit of that bully pulpit, uh, because the main uh, advantage that having a bully pulpit gives you is it basically gives you built-in credibility. It's like saying, here, you can start with a higher level of credibility than you would have had otherwise, be that based on your political position, uh, for example, that would be how Teddy Rosa would have seen it, or your standing in society or your accomplishments. The text that I chose, uh, Walter Payton's Hall of Fame speech, his standing in the world of football, it gives him built-in credibility that I think gives him more power in his speaking and allows him to do different things than you would if you have to gain credibility. And so ideally, I, I'd start with a little thinking and discussion of people saying, well, how have we seen the bully pulpit in our texts? How have we seen it not exist? Um, but I'm gonna walk you through some of those, but I'm just gonna take a second. So everyone, everyone watching at home, uh, I'm gonna fill in some time in this video, like a minute or two, just sort of think about how we've seen it in our text. You don't have to write anything. This isn't part of the activity or anything, but just take some time and think about what we've seen in our in-class texts. Well, now you've had some time to think and to ponder the meaning of the bully pulpit in our text. I'm just going to walk you through a couple that came to my mind when I was first thinking about it. 
Um, the first one that I thought of, and this was obviously because I wrote a whole essay on it, um, was Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July speech. And this would be a good example, I think, of someone who didn't have that bully pulpit. Because um, in my essay, in my analysis, I sort of broke it down into three parts. And the first third or so of his speech was dedicated to capturing the audience to saying to them, hey, you should listen to me. And that's essentially making up that ground. That's taking, I think it was about six or seven pages of that speech that we read. It's taking a significant portion of your speech just to get your audience to even listen to your message in the first place. And so that's somewhere where if Frederick Douglass was speaking perhaps to an audience that knew the significance of him, like if he were to come, if he came back to life and gave a speech today when people have had time to recognize the significance, or if he was giving a speech to maybe a different audience at the time, like perhaps a, a black audience who knows him more as part of the community, where he had that standing already, it would have made his speech different. He would have given a different speech because he wouldn't have had to spend so much time telling his audience, hey, listen to me. Um, and then I think Sojourn of Truth, very similar, Ain't I a Woman? Um, she was, I guess it sort of depends on which version you read, but it seemed like in reading it that she wasn't necessarily as interested in getting that level of credibility. She had the, the everyman appeal was her credibility and so she didn't need to pander I guess in the way that some other speakers do to endear themselves to their audience but even she she had to she was laying out her credentials what qualified her to be talking she was like I I do this and I woman I I do this I do that I can do this look at my qualifications and that was sort of similarly dictating to her audience hey, I'm someone that should be listened to. Um, and that's sort of thing that comes with when you go in as that everyman personality, you're not going to have the boy pull, but you, by definition, the everyman is not going to have that elevated position. And so I think that's something that's really interesting. Uh, and then the last one I want to look, I want to look at one that did have the boy pull, but now be, that would be our favorite, our favorite stuttering King Birdie um, in the King's speech and how he has the very definition of a bully pulpit. He is the monarch. He is the figurehead of an entire nation. Um, everyone's listening to him every time he talks, and obviously he hates that, but it gives him it gives him a lot of power when he does speak, and it also clearly registers with him in the movie. He recognizes that his words have power, and when his words are faltering, so is the power that they convey. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting example of someone who has a boy pulpit, but isn't able to use it necessarily to the fullest extent, if that makes sense. Um, but I just think that's a, I think it's a good sort of balance of the text we've read of having a boy pulpit, not having a bully pulpit, how these different levels uh, can influence the speeches you give. Uh, and then that sort of brings me to the text that I wanted you guys uh, to watch or read, however you chose to uh, consume this Hall of Fame induction speech. Um, I apologize to those of you who are not huge sports fans. It probably isn't super relevant to you, but that's something that is very interesting to me. And I figured it was a good way to incorporate speeches and different speech giving concepts with something that I'm interested in. So that's why that's why I chose it. Um, for those of you who don't know or didn't figure out, Walter Payton is widely regarded as one of, if not the best running backs of all time in the NFL. Um, he's also uh, been an incredible influence or was an incredible influence in his community. The Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year award is named after him. So basically he's a very, very important figure in that world. Uh, and when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame, he was that guy. Everyone knew Walter Payton. His name, nickname was Sweetness. Like he was that level of famous. He had that respect in the community already. 
he had the bully pulpit and so he was able to use that and his speech is different and reflects how he has that bully pulpit and so i wanted to go through a couple of key points that i noticed um and i mean i really wish we could be having a discussion with this so i could ask you guys but i just wanted to point some of the things i found interesting um if you guys have any other ideas um feel free to keep those in mind i'm sure they're just as important or relevant as mine these are just the things that i noticed um so at the very beginning um he starts by thanking all the people that helped him along the way very stereotypical for award acceptance speeches all of which are in the same vein of you have been recognized for being the top of your profession if you're if you're given an oscar people know who you are you have just reached the pinnacle of your career and so you don't need to introduce yourself to your audience and be like hi i'm i'm nicholas i i won an oscar like i i wouldn't have to do that if i won an oscar everyone would know who i was and so they replace that beginning the part that i talked about with frederick douglas where he's pandering for lack of a better phrase to his audience they're able to replace that with a thank you to the people who got them there and i think that that little switch is something that's neat to look at um because people know who you are and so you're thanking the other people whereas if you're trying to introduce yourself they already know who they are they don't know you and so it's that weird switch route but i think it's something neat to look at when you have the blood pulpit and how that affects your speaking uh and then one of my uh first favorite quotes um this is when he's talking about his family and his upbringing it's like quote that's the reason why i had the moves that i did because when you have an angry sister and an angry brother chasing you with a broom and a, and a wet dish rag, you tend to pick up moves that you never had before. And as anyone with a sibling or multiple siblings can understand, that is a, a very relatable quote to those of us. If you are an only child, good for you, I guess. You never got chased around the house with various instruments. Um, but. I really enjoyed how he injected humor into the speech, but there's also a subtle thing in there that you might not catch, is he, he starts saying, that's the reason I had the moves that I did. He assumes everyone knows his moves, and he's right. Everyone who's in that audience, everyone who's watching him give a Hall of Fame inducted speech knows the moves that Walter Payton has. You don't, he's not gonna be like, here, watch this highlight film of me and then I will continue with my speech. There's an assumption generally that people already know who he is, what he's done. And that's one of the things that comes with the boy pulpit. For example, you go back to Teddy Roosevelt who invented it. People know who he is. He's, he's the president of the United States. And that, that applies to almost any major national level politician, uh, top level professional athletes, celebrities. You know who they are. They don't have to give a little biography about who they are because you know and that's comes through in these speeches it allows the speeches to flow better i think you don't have to break off to be like oh yeah i did this thing i was like yeah the thing you did that i already know about and so i think that really helps with giving a speech i think it makes it better honestly um i mean in a perfect world your audience would already know everything sort of about you you wouldn't have to do that Obviously not all of us are famous and at the top of our professions, but I think that contributes to why speeches like this are so celebrated. Uh, the next quote that I really liked, quote, And because of my wanting to give to so many other people, sometimes you, you tend to neglect the people that you truly love the most. Uh, this is in the section of his speech where he is simultaneously thanking and apologizing to his family um he is talking about how he dedicated so much time to football that he didn't spend time with his kids with his wife with the people who really matter to him and i think that's a sentiment that is pretty universal within the professional athlete community um and i'm 
if you stop and think about it, I'm sure you can understand. I mean, they're traveling. If you're in the NFL every week, you're in a different city. You're traveling all over the country. If you're in other professional sports, it's even worse. You have more games in more places. Um, and it's obvious that you don't have that sort of time to dedicate. Uh, and that's something that is understood innately by the audience. And it's also something that shows a level of vulnerability for someone speaking from a position of power. And so I think that when you're speaking from a bully pulpit, those moments, the self-deprecating, the apologetic moments, they mean more because you're coming down from such a high level where, whereas if I was to say, if I said sorry to my sister right now, I was like, yeah, I mean, like, we were siblings. But like, if I went off and I won a Nobel Peace Prize in my speech, I said sorry to my sister. Very different context, very different things because I'm lowering myself significantly more than I would be just sitting in my bedroom right now. Um, and so I think that the blue pulpit allows not only for greater, I don't know, greater power in your speech, but it also allows you to p appear even more humble if you do choose that route. And so not, it's you, you're having it both ways. You're able to you're able to be the powerful leader speaker or you're able to be the empathetic speaker. And I think it's an incredibly powerful point to be able to have both of those just from one sort of concept of speaking. And it's honestly something that people should take advantage of if you're, and people do take advantage of it. I mean, if you're famous and giving, you're giving a speech, you're able to utilize all of that. That, I think that's a really interesting aspect of the bully pulpit that you might not recognize as much because you see it as the the figurehead and maybe not the person who's being humble. Uh, another aspect of the speech I wanted to focus on was the it was a brief moment, but he discussed Pete Rose a little bit. Um, this is another uh, sports little deep dive here and i apologize again for those of you who aren't sports fans but pete rose very very good baseball player um he was one of the top names in the sport for at least a decade around the same time that walter payton was playing uh in his, during his career he was discovered to be gambling on games and he was banned for life by major league baseball it's been a controversial decision in the past. It continues to be today because he's been blackballed from the league. He's not in the Hall of Fame. Um, and so when Walter Payton chooses to address that, Walter Payton, who is the best athlete in that Hall of Fame class, one of the biggest names in professional sports at that time, he's choosing to stand up for Pete Rose, someone who has been really vilified by his sport by the sports community in general at the time i think it demonstrates that you can take controversial positions when you have the bully pulpit that you might not get to take otherwise and i mean this is this is the right level of controversy if that makes sense you can take these things that are maybe controversial to a specific group of people but that's like that's not an offensive position to take, but it's certainly controversial. People strongly disagree. I mean, for example, I don't think Walter Payton could come out and insult groups of people um, in his speech and get away with it. That's not that level of controversy. But if there's these strong debates that maybe divide opinion, and you're allowed to address that, again, if, you, if you've watched any Hollywood award ceremony in the last three and a half years you'll you'll recognize it's uh political statements are one of the major ones you see in bully pulpit style speeches but again it can range across the board any controversy that you can think of you get more freedom in a bully pulpit speech to address that because it's your moment that is you have earned this in Walter Payton's case you earn this by being the best running back in NFL history that you can talk about damn near whatever you want uh, and I think that's that's really important and that's fairly obvious but I wanted to dig into that because it's one of the key aspects of having a bully pulpit speech um, and it's something that I think you can get into a little bit in the activity which we'll get to in a second uh, but the last 
part of his speech that I wanted to analyze. It's the quote that's most famous uh, in the speech. It's a quote. Life is short. It's oh so sweet. There are a lot of people that we meet in as we walk through, through these shallow halls. But the thing that means the most are the friendships that you meet and take along with you. And so that's, that's his main message. That's, I think if you could ask him, pick one sentence that your audience is going to leave with, I think that would be it. I mean, if it is, then he nailed it, because that's the one that people remember from the speech. That's sort of why it's so famous. I mean, I think my dad has probably said that to me no less than a dozen times in the last, like, two years. So, like, it's a very famous phrase. Um, and you get to you get to pick a message in a bully pulpit speech and really drive it home well. I mean, you should be doing that in any speech. Um, you should have the main point you want to make. Uh, but in a bully pulpit speech, it really can be anything you want. Um, and that's... That's a very uplifting message. Um, I think that's that's driven by this specific speech, the Hall of Fame commencement speech. It's it's like if you all of us at our high school graduations had speakers. I'm sure it's student speakers, outside speakers, whoever they were. I'm almost certain you heard a "you can do anything with your life" type speech. That's very common. Um, but those uplifting moments are more powerful when you hear them from a person that's at that level of having a bully pulpit speech. And if they don't want to necessarily give an uplifting speech, if they want to give a speech of warning, if they want to do any of that sort of stuff, they have that power, they can pick that phrase. And that, that phrase idea, that one sentence to be remembered is something I want you to keep in your mind as you move into our activity. I know I have talked for a long time into this camera and you're probably tired of looking at my face uh but bear with me i just need to introduce the activity real quick and then you guys can do some of your own work uh so the activity that i want you guys to do uh is in your course journals i want you to take either either a title or that one sentence that i was talking about for what your bully pulpit speech would be so if you could you are standing up in front of i don't know say all UVA undergrads or our class, like pick a big group of people and you're standing in front of them and you can talk about whatever you want. You have somehow validated yourself to be their speaker and you can say whatever you want. What what do you want to say? Pick your title of your speech, that one sentence, you, that one message you want to send, write that down. And then underneath that, like, I don't know, two to five sentences, uh, summary why you want to do that, why this matters to you, something along those lines, reflecting on why that would be your message. Um, and I'll give you guys five minutes to do this, and uh, it sucks. Ideally, we would be able to share these. Speaking of sharing, in my original recording, I forgot to mention what mine would be, so at least I can share an example for you guys. Uh, so what I would say would be, the best experiences don't just happen, you have to put in work for them. Uh, that's in the inspirational vein of Walter Payton's. Uh, but I'd go on to explain that the best experience of my life have been things that followed struggle, things that followed hard work. And so in my mind, you don't just let life happen to you. You have to go out and grab it. Uh, so that'd be my example. Um, you saw Walter Baden's. You, I'm sure, have something in your mind. And so sorry for messing up my original recording. I'm back to, back to the OG. Um, I'm not going to have this posted anywhere because I mean, this could be very private and if if it is that's fine just in your course journals just think about it write it down um and then we'll get back for concluding in five minutes so go
all right so i hope hope you guys had fun jotting down jotting down some little notes uh so i come back to sort of conclude this lesson uh what did we learn um we learned about what the bully pulpit is how how we've seen it in our text and one that i forgot to mention earlier and i feel bad about the oprah winfrey speech from back at the beginning very similar to the one we just watched the wall of Payton one so keep that one in mind as well i feel bad for missing that but basically a bully pulpit is something that you should want to have if possible um if you're speaking to a group of people that are for example within your academic field you want to try and have that bully pulpit you want to be that figure and that's something you should try and establish because even if you don't come in with that you can be like frederick douglas and establish your credibility you want to try and build to that level where you can then go say what you want say what you, the message that you want to say um and so when you're using it in your speeches try and establish that credibility and get to that level and then in your life in general hopefully we will all be successful and we will all earn our own specific pulpits to share our views um i hope you all enjoyed listening to me talk and i hope you're staying safe back home um and thanks everybody peace